Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. I want to begin a short series with you. I think it's very apropos for September when we think of going back to school. I want to share with you a spiritual refresher course beginning today with the idea of the game of life and how to play it. And how to play it in such a way that we play it more successfully so that we are able to live a life of greater joy, of greater purpose, of greater satisfaction, of greater abundance. But the only way to do that, the only way I know to do that, is to play the game of life consciously. And so I'll be sharing some ideas with you on what that looks like, playing the game of life consciously. But to play any game, to become good at anything, requires practice. We don't get to start at the top. We start at the beginning. If we wanted to learn how to play the piano, we would be foolish to sit at that piano and just try to make sense of those black spots called notes on the piece of paper and try to make sense of the white keys and the black keys and try to put it all together on our own. We just, it would sound awful. Right, JR? Nobody would want to listen to that. We would know that in order to learn how to play the piano, we would have to rely on somebody who already knew how to do it. And for that person to sit with us and teach us the basics, and for us to go through those very basic things of scales and anything else that is basic to the fundamentals of playing the piano, and to do it over and over and over and over, and probably be bored silly, because we'd want to be doing what? Playing something beautiful right from the start. But we don't get to do that until we learn what those basics are, and we're willing to stay with them and practice them consistently. Life is the same way for us. And the spiritual principles and spiritual rules that are a heart of our, at, at the heart of our teaching in unity is not something that we come into this life automatically knowing. And unfortunately, many of these principles and concepts are still not yet things that are taught to us in school. I think they should be, and I think they could be, because these are spiritual principles, universal principles that really aren't religious. But anyway, that's a whole other, whole other subject. Our life can either be a rewarding game or a really frustrating one. I love the two words, frustrating or fascinating. Frustrating or fascinating. And when I find myself in a place of feeling frustrated about something, most of the time I remember to stop for a moment and ask myself, what could I do? What could I be thinking? How could I step into the energy of fascination rather than frustration? Fascination feels good. Would you not agree? Frustration, not so much so. Not so much so. But it's a part of learning to play the game of life differently, to play it more consciously. So here are seven rules that I want to share with you that I believe make a difference in playing the game of life more successfully because we're playing it more consciously. The first is this, knowing that life works according to law, a law that is impersonal, dependable, and unchangeable. Knowing that life works according to law, a law that is impersonal, dependable, and unchangeable. Now, obviously, I'm not speaking of man-made law. I'm speaking of divine law. I'm speaking of spiritual law. I'm speaking of universal law. As a somewhat of an illustration, we know the power of law. We know that there is a, a law called aerodynamics, right? And we can fly planes because we understand how to work within the laws of aerodynamics. If we did not understand what those laws were, we wouldn't be able to keep that plane in the air. I am still, every time I fly, and I fly pretty frequently, I'm fascinated I try not to think too much about the mystery of how that thing stays up there with all of us in it. 
but I know that it does. And it does because the law is understood and the law is used or followed in an impersonal way. Impersonal law does not play favorites. It doesn't say, oh, you're really nice and kind, so I'm going to be more gentle with you. Try that with gravity, right? But I'm a really nice person. I'm kind, I'm loving, I'm sweet. Whoops, I'm still going to go where if I'm on the edge of a cliff? I'm going to go down, right? So our niceness or our goodness as a person does not overcome ignorance of divine law. That's really important. Our niceness, our kindness does not overcome ignorance of divine law. Unlike natural laws of gravity or physics or aerodynamics, spiritual laws need to be learned and practiced. Just like if you want to be able to play the piano, you have to understand some of the very basic fundamentals of scales and be able to use them accurately. So the law is impersonal, and we need to understand that. Second rule is that the result of any situation must be equal to the cause. The result of any situation must be equal to the cause. What does that sound like? It sounds like physics, right? It sounds like physics. For every action, there must be an equal and opposite Reaction, that's the way it's expressed in physics. The way we express it in metaphysics are with words or phrases like the golden key, like the law of mind action, thoughts held in mind produce in the outer after their kind. Okay, I better teach this to you. Thoughts held in mind produce in the outer after their kind. Say that with me. Thoughts held in mind produce in the outer after their kind. Thoughts held in mind produce in the outer after their kind. It's the law of mind action. The challenge for us is it doesn't always show up immediately. And it sometimes takes a little while to understand how that law is operating but operating it is at all times. If you want to know how well the law is working or how well you are working the law in your life, what do you think you can do? I hear some of you kind of saying it, tiptoeing around it, look at your life. Look at your life. Look at your relationships. Look at your sense of joy and satisfaction in your life. Look at what is showing up in your life and staying in your life. The staying part is really important because some things seem to kind of just come and then they do go. But I'm talking about what are the kinds of circumstances, situations, opportunities, or challenges, the kinds of people, the kind of health, the kind of abundance or lack of it. What is showing up in your life and what is staying? You know, many people look at others that have something good, and they see the good that others have, whether it's great relationships or an abundant life or robust health, they look at others and they see what they have and they want what they have, but they're unwilling to do the inner work and the outer work that the other has done to manifest that situation or those situations. We call this Metaphysics 101. Metaphysics 101. Rule number three, change the inner and the outer will change too. It has to. It has to. Change the inner and the outer will change too. It has to. We are powerful radiating centers of dynamic energy. Some of us are incredibly creative and incredibly powerful in creating problem after problem after problem after problem. And then reinforcing it by telling everybody about it. Now, I'm not talking about the good sharing in therapy to get past something. I'm talking about the repetitive living within a story of negativity. That's not healthy. Changing the inner doing our inner work, the outer will change. There's such a tendency in many of us, and perhaps it's just part and parcel of being human, of trying to turn the tables and make it be about somebody else. If they only showed up different, then my life would work. Well, guess what? That's not the way it works. 
they might start to show up differently, but if you still show up the same way you have shown up, you will recreate that person, that pattern, that situation again in the form of another person. Does that make sense? So where is the work? The work is our inner work. Change the inner and the outer will change. We can practice. The mind is so powerful. If I asked you absolutely positively, do not think of a luscious lemon, bright yellow, you've just sliced it open, you're squeezing it in a, into a glass of water. The only way you could not be thinking of that is if you're doing what? Plugging your ears or thinking of something else. And I bet if we were to have equipped you with a, I forget the thing that measures, um, uh, saliva, that your saliva would have been producing as you were imagining that. Why? Did you actually have a lemon in your hand? Come on, you are awake, right? I know you're awake. <laughs> you didn't have a lemon in your hand, but the mind is so powerful that it's going to follow and it's going to have an impact on your body, but also on, in the further dimensions of your life itself. I can remember vividly when I first started to understand unity and first started attending unity at all of, I think I was 17 or 18 years old. I was still in my ice skating days. And my parents couldn't always afford to, to buy me all the ice time I needed. But man, I would sit there sometimes in class when I was bored silly, and all I would do would be visualize every jump, every spin, and by golly, there, I did it again, Christine. Every time that I would get back on the ice right after doing that, I skated better. What was the difference? I was changing the inner, and the outer was beginning to follow. Do not go around asking your friends when they're going through a big mess and a challenge, hey, what did you do to create that? What inner stuff was going on that created that outer mess? In your Don't do that. That's metaphysical malpractice. <laughs> if that person comes to you genuinely, and you've got some knowledge and experience yourself, if that person comes to you genuinely and says, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I keep finding myself in this kind of situation, can you listen and can you maybe share with me from your point of view? Then by all means talk at what you might understand to be going on from the inner. But never, ever do that uninvited. Not unless you want to get rid of every nice person in your entire life. Rule number four, you can't reap and keep what you haven't sown and grown. You can't reap and keep what you haven't sown and grown. Fundamental, like produces like kind. Simple as that. Simple as that. You have to be what you want to attract. It starts at the being level. We tend to get it backwards. We think life happens from the having level to the doing level to the being level, but it doesn't go that way. It goes from the being level to the doing level to the having level. We have to be what it is that we want to attract. We have to be willing to give what we want to receive. We have to be willing to give what we want to receive. It's a fundamental principle. Every farmer knows it. If they want to, to reap a crop of luscious tomatoes, they can't be planting turnip seeds and then complaining that they got turnips. If money is what you need, you can't hoard it. You've got to put it into circulation. If time is what you need, you can't be stingy with it. You have to be willing to use it wisely. These are basic, basic, basic spiritual principles and practices that when we work them consistently, absolutely do change our lives. One of the things that makes it a little bit easier, I think, is hanging around with people who are already trying to do it themselves. Because have you noticed that not everybody is into waking up? Have you noticed that? Yeah, not everybody is into waking up. That doesn't mean we have to be in judgment of it. We can be discerning and notice that there's a difference. Discernment is important. We can be discerning and notice that there's a difference. Who we want to make sure we are spending at least some quality time hanging out with are people who are trying to live their lives from the inside out, trying to awaken consciously, trying to live by spiritual principle and use spiritual practice. Those are the folks we want to hang out with. Why? 
No idea why? Besides, they're usually fun people to hang out with. But, but we begin to get strengthened when we see and feel and hear a similar language, a similar practice, a similar motivation. It's encouraging to us and strengthens us in those times where maybe we're waffling a little bit. Does that make sense? It's one of the reasons that life groups at the church can be such a powerful place to practice or going upstairs every Sunday after service and meeting with Michael and Leah and being part of the discussion group and going deeper into these practices. Just coming on Sunday morning and sitting and enjoying the music and the message and meditation and then leaving isn't enough to change your life. It's not enough to change your life. It's the deep, consistent practice and being with people of like mind, that over time, like sitting and playing this, the piano scales again and again and again and improving a little bit at a time is what changes our lives. The fifth rule, how you meet life directly affects what you receive from life. How you meet life directly affects what you receive from life. I like to look at life, the metaphor of life is like a river. And that river is constantly flowing. And it doesn't care whether I know that it's flowing or not. It's constantly flowing. And I can go down to that river one day and be happy and dancing and joyous. Or I could go down to that river one day and be angry and frustrated instead of fascinated. I can go down to that river and cry. But the river doesn't care. It just keeps what? It just keeps flowing regardless of how I am when I interact with it. However, I can also go to that river to take some water from it. And I can go to that river with a teaspoon. I can go to that river with a cup. I can go to that river with a bucket. I can go to that river with a water tanker. Whatever I go to that river with, ready to receive from that river, is going to directly impact my experience. Too many people go to that river with a cup, and they get upset when they see others leaving with a tanker full of water. What's the difference? The difference is the consciousness of the individual approaching that river. The river is a metaphor for our life. How are we stepping into the flow of our lives? How are we meeting the flow of our life? What are we doing from the inside to expand our consciousness so we can receive from life I'm not talking about stuff, although stuff does come, that we can receive from life in a sense of abundance. It means that we have got to continue to grow in openness and in capacity so that we can receive. Our consciousness and belief system determines how we approach life. Some of us have to do some healing work there. Some of us may have grown up either in a religion or in a family of origin that somehow left us feeling unworthy of good. Believe it or not, there are prayers that still affirm our unworthiness, right? If we feel unworthy, do you think we're going to go to the river with a water tank or with a teaspoon? Probably more like a teaspoon, right? More like a... I'm not going to go there. I'll get too off track. Never mind. Another lesson. Rule number six. It's not about going from negative thinking to positive thinking. Now take a breath into that, because you might go, huh, I thought all this was about positive thinking. No, it's about aligned thinking. Aligned thinking. Aligned thinking is usually positive, but it's also much deeper. Positive thinking tends to just ride on the surface. Aligned thinking has to do with connecting with divine law, has to do with connecting with God, has to do with putting our minds in direct alignment with the highest principle and highest thought called God. When we do that, we are tapping into, it's like the difference, I believe, between tapping into 110 volts and tapping into 240 volts. Big, big difference. And the seventh and the last rule is this, that we are always, always, always 100% responsible for our reactions to life. We are always 100% responsible for our reactions to life and the choices that we make. 
Nobody else is inside of you reacting. Nobody else is inside of me reacting. When things happen, I may not like them. Have, any, have you had anything happen this week that you didn't like? Raise your hand. Have you had more than one thing maybe that happened this week that you didn't like? And maybe it even wasn't of your choosing. Sometimes we have things happen that we don't like and we actually chose it right? You know, be careful what you ask for in prayer. You might get it only to discover that you meant something different, right? But um, the no matter what's going on in our lives, and this is so basic, but it's so important. And for many of us, there's still a significant room for improvement here. Absolutely acknowledging and, uh, and understanding that no matter what is going on, we, whether we like it or not, whether we ask for it or not, whether it seems fair or not, whether we understand it or not, we are still 100% responsible for how we show up and the choices we make from that. When we live from that practice of being 100% responsible for how we show up, we will, over time, earn the right to be in better and better and better situations and better and better and better relationships. Don't hear me say, though, that it means there will never be stuff that happens that you don't like. It just won't affect you to the same degree that it does when you don't take 100% responsibility. Does that make sense? Yes? Let me ask you a question. In Listening to these rules, is there any part of any of them that you feel you could work on a little bit more than you have right now? Seven? Okay, boy, we're into honesty this morning. That's wonderful because I feel the same way about myself. You know, I don't know if this is true, JR. I know it was true in my days of ice skating that even when you're very accomplished at something, my teacher used to always make me periodically go back to the basics. Do you ever go back to some of the very basic things of piano a little, right? Just to make sure that, that if the basics are solid and if the foundation is solid, then everything that is built upon that becomes stronger and more stable. And I think that's in part what we're looking for. So, matter, so no matter where we are in our life today, there is a better version of ourselves, a better life experience waiting for us that we can step into because we are forever growing and evolving. I forgot to share this with you at the beginning, but there is a, an old book. It is still out on, on, in Amazon, I think, um, written by Florence Scovel Shen called The Game of Life and How to Play It. If you're not familiar with her, these are some, she and her other books are very good metaphysics 101 primers and great reminders as well. So quick, quick recap. Life works according to law and that law is impersonal, dependable, and unchangeable. The second was the result of any situation must be equal to the cause. The third, change the inner and the outer will change. It absolutely has to. The fourth, you can't reap and keep what you haven't sown and grown. The fifth, how you meet life directly affects what you're going to receive from life. The sixth, it's not about going from negative thinking to positive thinking. It's about practicing right thinking or aligned thinking. And the last is you're always 100% responsible for your reaction to whatever is going on in your life. Namaste.